Yes, I think we can. We can kick off now. So it's time to, to start. So thank you so much for joining this uh, webinar on optimizing IVF success in the ALT lab. And um, on behalf of the Association for Fertility and Reproductive Health, which is the National Fertility Association in Nigeria, in collaboration with Nash Nordical Fertility Center Lagos, I welcome you to this webinar. There is no doubt that if wishes were horses, IVF practitioners will want all their patients to get pregnant after every IVF cycle. However, we know that this is far from what the technology delivers presently. We, right now, um, a couple of weeks ago, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority in the UK released the 2018 data showing an average birth rate of 23% by embryo transfer. We know that implantation continues to be the rate limiting factor in uh, IVF success. And for us to have implantation, a viable embryo must be present. Today, we're going to be looking at ways to optimize success in the IVF laboratory by choosing the very best embryos for embryo transfer. To discuss this very important topic, we have some very experienced and highly trained embryologists on the panel. I, I guess I'm the only odd man out. I'm not an embryologist, but uh, I've been co-opted by, <laughs> by my guy. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have to be with the embryologist today. Well, I'm gonna to try to introduce, introduce the embryologist starting from Joy. Joy is the senior clinical embryologist with Nordica Fertility Center. She's actually based in Asaba. She holds a master's degree in cell biology and genetics. Her interest is majorly in the field of genetics and ovarian tissue crowd preservation. She's going to be introducing the topic to us and she's going to be talking about how to choose the embryo to transfer in the laboratory. And then she'll be passing the touch to Dr. Carmen Garcia. Carmen has a PhD in biotechnology at the University of Valencia. She has extensive experience in the study of chromosomal abnormalities in the embryos using next generation sequencing technology at the pre-implantation genetic screening laboratory with Egenomics Valencia Spain. She was also laboratory manager of Egenomics Mexico. And like I said, she's presently working in Valencia in the PGS research department. She's working especially with the non-invasive PGTA. And then after she will be talking about is PGS the answer to embryo selection? And then Dr. Alexia Chapatzi Parasidos. She's a senior clinical embryologist with many years of experience. She has special interest in efficient total quality management and risk management in ALT units in the context of process optimization and standardization, as well as the implementation of risk mitigation strategies. Alex co-founded Embryo Lab Academy and has organized a series of international workshops on TQM and RM for ALT units, crowd preservation and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. She has authored a number of scientific articles, posters and chapters in some books, and uh, she's uh, they're going to enjoy a talk as well. And then last but not the least, we have Dr. Jelis Palmer. Jelis is a senior clinical embryologist and uh, he's skilled in the business and quality management. He holds a consultancy position for Iceland First IVF Clinic and was director of the assisted reproductive unit at Mitera Hospital in Athens. Um, right now, Jilis is based in Wales in the UK and he has many publications in leading scientific journals. 
He's also a consultant and developer in a wide range of in the industry, including clean room technology, quality management, risk assessment for clinics, and cryo storage facilities, as well as artificial intelligence. And he is going to be talking about artificial intelligence and embryo selection in the future. Whilst Alexia will be talking about time, time lapse technology, the role in embryo selection. I guess you're going to have a swell time today. And uh, I'm not going to waste for that time. I'm just going to hand over to Joy to start the ball rolling so that she can tell us about how to choose the best embryo to transfer in the laboratory. Joy, you have the floor. Thank you very much, sir. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's great to be part of this webinar on um, looking at optimizing um, IVF success in the laboratory. So I'll be um, talking about how to choose the ideal embryo for transfer. A few minutes, I'll be sharing my slide. Hope everyone can see my slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how to choose the ideal embryo for transfer? Um, my name is John. The presentation. Sorry, just give me a minute. Uh, uh, there is a uh, one member of the panel that I've not introduced. Damilola Atiba is also on the panel. She's the chief embryologist in Nordica, so she's part of the panel. So, Joy, you can go on. Thank you. So, um, in assisted reproduction, fertility experts, um, clinicians, embryologists, we are constantly taking and making decisions at every stage of the process. And one crucial step where we also get to take decisions is embryo transfer, which is also a stage in in vitro fertilization process where we, the embryologists, uh, actually get to decide on what day do we want to uh, transfer embryos, how many embryos do we want to transfer to select for um, transfer. The culture of zygotes to embryos in the laboratory for some days actually allow for um, assessment of the morphology and development of the embryos. Initially, this was actually used to define embryo development. And then later, it became a tool for selecting the best embryos for transfer. Best embryos, by that I mean embryos with the highest implantation potential, because contribution to implantation from the embryos is actually 60%. And so in the laboratory, we keep a very close eye on our embryos. Assisted reproductive techniques have made many advancements since the birth of Louis Brown in 1978. And various approaches have been undertaken, including those that assess um, embryos either sequentially at several stages of development or only once immediately before transfer. And in a bid to also increase pregnancy rates, about two to three embryos are usually considered for um, transfer with the goal of at least one implanting and leading to life birth. But we also agree with me that even in an ideal cultural environment and laboratory, there are still variations in embryo development from the same cohorts of embryos. What I mean by that is that embryos from the same cohort still won't appear or look the same to us under the microscope. And that leaves embryologists at a fix on which embryos to select for transfer. So here we are, we really don't know which road to go, we don't know which embryo to select, so we're at a cross road. So grading and selection of embryos, which is actually um, largely based on the morphological characteristics of the embryos, only guides us in selecting embryos with the highest potential of implanting 
and leading to live birth. So morphological selection of embryos has been the traditional method of selecting embryos and is still the core of daily laboratory practice in IVF. So basically the aim of this uh, presentation is to enlighten us on what has been the norm and what is still the norm, those characteristics that we actually look at or watch out for when choosing embryos for transfer. So there are different selection techniques. We have selection based on morphology. That is how the embryos look, how they appear to us under the microscope, which is what I will be expatiating on in this presentation. Studies have also listed metabolomics to be a selection tool. This allows us to measure the profile of different metabolites as key nutrients in embryo cultural media, helping us to formulate a viability score correlated to implantation potential, but its efficacy is still under debate. There is also pre-implantation genetic testing, which um, is also done prior to embryo transfer and helps to clarify the issue of genetic well-being of embryos, helping us to avoid the transfer of aneuploid embryos. But this is not a standard um, practice in many IVF clinics across the world because there is an additional cost that is attached to this um, service. Time-last imaging is simply an advanced take on the standard morphological analysis, which provides more frequent observation in a controlled environment. So in this case, the frequent observation is believed to provide substantially more information about the relationship between timing and embryo viability. We have other presenters I'll be talking about uh, PGT, timeless imaging, and artificial intelligence, which is what is new now. This is roughly modeled after the neural networks of the brain, analyzing information in increasing levels of complexity. What it does is it simply mimics the human being using sensory organs. So talking about morphological um, grading system, morphological scoring of gametes and embryos have been in existence, like I said, since the inception of IVF and numerous systems using various combinations of characteristics and days of evaluations have been developed to grade and rank embryos. A large number of studies have been published that also propose various uh, um, um, combinations. All over the world, each laboratory may slightly grade or select a, a, a embryos in a different way, but the key and most important thing is that we are all noting the same morphological pictures. Also, we have different stages of assessment and um, scoring. But currently, emphasis is placed on the cleavage stage and the blastocyst stage when considering embryos for transfer. But the cumulus oocyte complex and um, the zygos cannot be neglected as many investigators have found a relationship between oocyte, PN scoring, and improved embryo development and blastocyst formation. However, there are also other studies failed to show the additional scoring system does, in fact, improve selection of viable Briefly, I will mention what we'll be looking out for during um, oocyte pickup and after fertilization. Assessment of oocyte is actually rudimentary, whereby uh, we look out for cumulus cell masses and try to find itself very quickly. If you can imagine a chicken egg that is cracked open, you have the egg yolk at, at, at the middle, at the center, and surrounded by explain what we are looking for. The human oocyte is more at the center, same like the egg yolk, and then surrounded by egg white. So a typical mature oocyte displays expanded radiating corona. It's clear to see that microscopic. And then for immature or uh, dense compact cumulus cells and adherent compact layer of corona, if present, and then for post mature, we have expanded uh, 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 cumulus uh, uh, um, um, cells with clumps radiated corona. And then looking at atretic or degenerative um, oocyte, uh, they are clumped with very irregular corona if present. Also, 
So looking at um, um, after fertilization, looking at the, 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 the zygotes, we have a commonly used system that assess the presence of two pronuclei, um, relative position and number of the nucle uh, nucleoli precursor bodies, and then uh, with the evaluation of the pronuclei size and alignment. Zygotes with absence of two pronuclei, then presence of one pronucleus with an abnormal feature such as VACO, and then presence of three pronuclei should not be considered for transfer as they will not form a viable pregnancy, even if they develop to become embryos, of which most of them do develop to become embryos. And then looking at the cleavage stage, an embryo starts as a single cell. And then as it develops, the cell continually divides so that a two cell embryo becomes a, a four cell embryo. And then a four cell embryo also divides to become an eight cell embryo and so on. Each embryo will develop at a slightly different rate, but usually by day four, an embryo should have over 10 cells, which will be tightly packed together. Also in a perfect embryo, the cells will divide evenly so that each cell appears to be identical in size and in shape. And then also looking at uh, fragments, they are common occurrence in human embryos. A fragment is a membrane bound extracellular cytoplasmic structure that has been found to be linked to abnormalities in cell division that may reflect apoptosis, which means cell death. It can be thought of, of it can be thought of as um, crumbs when a piece of bread is broken. Although beautiful babies have uh, resulted from embryos with fragments. So if we are to grade or select embryos at clinic stage, we look at the number of cells or blastomers, if two cell, if three cell, if five cell, if six cell, on a particular day. And also we check for multinucleation. You look at each of the blastomers and check if they are multinucleated or not. And preferably these have been advised uh, and, uh, to be checked on a day two. Then we also consider the degree of fragments. The simplest scoring system for fragmentation describes the percentage of the volume of embryo occupied by um, fragments. So the score can be 0%, it can be 10%, it can be 20%. Embryos with very high degree of fragments have a reduced chance of implantation. And then also we also look at the size of the blastoma, if they are equal or not. Asynchrony can result from uneven distribution of various organelles between two sister cells. So which is good and which is bad? What do we want to consider? Which of the embryos do we want to consider for transfer? And which do we want to um, um, leave behind? Of all morphological characteristics, typically assessed in cleavage stage embryos, cell number is still believed to be the most important indicator for embryo viability. So for an embryo to be graded good, it has to be four cells on a day two, seven to nine cells on a day three. And then if we are grading an embryo to be a fair embryo, we should be looking at five to six cells on a day two, and then six cells and above nine cells on a day three. Yes, faster cleaving embryos. And then for us to grade an embryo poor, we should be looking at less than four cells on a day two and less than six cells on a day three. For faster cleaving embryos from studies, they've been associated with um, reduced implantation rate, and they are more likely to be chromosomally abnormal. Different studies have also said different things about fragments. So we have a study saying that cleavage with similar implantation rates to blastosis. And then we have another study that is saying that less than 10% fragmentation is high scoring, why above 50% is poor. And we have another study again saying that uh, implantation is greatest with less than 10% fragmentation, is less with 10 to 25%, and is reduced with 25 to 50%, and then it's worse with over 50% fragmentation. Then we also have other studies whereby we have Raquel in 2010 showing that the parameters from well with live beds, whereby we have less than 10% fragmentation as good embryos, 10 to 25 as fair, and 25 and above as uh, uh, poor. Then also looking at um, consensus scoring system for cleavage stage embryos, in addition to cell number, is also showing the grade for 
uh, uh, rating of embryos, grading an embryo good with 10% fragmentation, 10 to 25%, 10% uh, uh, fragmentation as good embryos, 10 to 25% as fair, and above 25% as poor. This is not also different from what uh, Rakowski et al. has shown. And then looking at the cell symmetry, embryos with uneven cell size have lower implantation rate from what studies have shown and pregnancy rate and are also more likely to be chromosomally abnormal. Your embryos made it to the blastocyst stage. This is quite an achievement. Often the implantation potential of the three embryos are judged based on making it to this stage. So this is also uh, uh, because from studies, we have seen that implantation rate is higher with um, transferring blastocyst um, uh, embryos compared to pivot stage uh, embryos. So this is also another way of selecting embryos for transfer by culturing your embryos for extra two days in the laboratory. So a value is given for the expansion. That is how big the embryo is. Then we also look at the quality of the inner cell mass, which are the cells that will develop to become the fetus. And then we also look at the quality of the trupetodem cells, which are the cells that will develop to become the placenta. So we have a study here. This is a national um, statistics looking at an average of close to 100,000 cycles and spans all kinds of grades, diagnoses, and number of embryos transferred. So they find embryos as against 34.9 for cleavage stage embryos for women that were 35 years and below. Another important uh, 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 um, fact that this study is also showing is that apart from transferring good quality embryos, age is also an important factor for success, as there was a drop with age to 3.2% for um, the five embryos for 44 years and above. So grading of embryos on day five, a value of 1.6 is given to the embryos for the expansion, looking at um, the blastocyl cavity. If it's less than half, it's more than 50%. If it's completely filled, and if the uh, embryo is uh, uh, fully expanded and the zone pellucida is gradually thinning out, or if the embryo has started hashing out, or if it's completely hashed out. So here we can see embryos are already hashing out, those that are completely uh, fully expanded and those that are completely hashed out. Again, we also look at the inner cell mass and we grade them using the alphabet A, B, or C, looking at uh, uh, embryos that have inner cell mass with many cells that are tightly packed to be graded A. And then for B, several cells that are loosely grouped. And then for C, uh, inner cell mass with very few cells. Also for trophetodem cells, where they are also graded either A, B, or C, depending on the grading system that is actually being used. Looking at uh, A, uh, uh, many with trophetodem cells of, uh, that have many cells present, forming a cohesive layer. And then B for few cells present, forming a loose epithelium. And then Cs for uh, uh, a very few large cells. The most used current system for evaluating blastocysts is the one that has been proposed by Gardner, which has shown to provide improved selection and higher implantation rates. Also, this is another study that was carried out in Japan, also showing that the higher the number, the more developed the embryo. So six here is the best for expansion. And then for the inner cell mass is A, and also A as the best for the trophy uh, to them. So grading of the inner cell mass is the most predictive in terms of pregnancy rate, even though it's been listed second in the grading system. Also here, we also have consensus um, scoring system for blastocyst stage that was reprinted from Alpha Scientists in Productive Medicine and S3 Special Interest Group of Embryologists whereby we had a, a number one to four assigned for expansion with four being uh, the best. And then we also have one to three for inner cell mass with one as good, which is the best. And then we also have one to three for the trophetodem cells, looking at one as good, which is also the best. Here also is another study, including over um, 1,500 embryos, where embryos were classified into six different groups by their morphological grades. And like birth rates was over 50%, close to 60% for 33 years and below when the best quality embryos were transferred. 
And the graph also shows that less attractive embryos, grade uh, uh, four, are also capable of uh, leading to live birth. We have about a 40% live birth for less attractive uh, embryos for younger age. So again, age has a great role to play, irrespective of the morphological grade of the embryos transferred. In fact, better looking embryos from a woman over age 38 typically succeeds as often as a less good looking embryos from a woman less than 33 years. Okay, so I have some embryos here. I have um, uh, embryo one and two as the five embryos and embryo three and four as cleavage stage embryos. So as an embryologist, if I were to grade these embryos, I am going to give embryo one a four BB. And if I were to grade embryo two, I'm going to give it a four CA. And then if I were to grade the cleavage stage embryos, embryo number three, I will grade it a fair. And embryo number four, I'm going to grade it good. If I have other embryologists here with me, about uh, uh, more than five embryologists here with me, I'm very sure that we will not all arrive at the same grade. They are not going to grade these embryos the same way I have graded them. So that brings me to the limitations. It is important to note that the grade does not always reflect the true potential of an embryo, and as embryo grading is highly subjective, great looking embryos often fail, and less good looking embryos are very capable of succeeding and leading to life death. Also, due to the subjective nature of the evaluations, drift in scoring and lack of definitive ways to assess the specific characteristics is likely with inter observal. Uh, 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 difference, which means among different embryologists and intra observer difference within the same embryologies. Also, there is no strong relationship between morphology and euploidy. Although morphological evaluation has been the main strategy applied in order to choose embryos for transfer, it has been shown that even aneuploid embryos are very capable of reaching high morphological scores. So having said all that, we should also remember that embryo quality evaluated by the embryo morphology is a critical parameter in human in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer. It also determines which embryos will be transferred. Pregnancy rates are directly related to number and quality of transferred embryos. So, but the, the ability to still identify the most viable embryo in the cohort still remains a challenge despite numerous grading system. Minimal requirements for embryo selection should include standardization, the ease of assessment, objectivity, minimal harm to embryo, and a high correlation with pregnancy rates. So bearing all of this in mind, active research is still needed in developing more non-invasive methods for scoring embryos and ranking them according to their ability to implant and give rise to healthy babies. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Joy. Um, yeah, you brought out a few things that we probably we'll talk about later on. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, uh, Dr. Carmen Gracia to talk about is PGS the answer to embryos? And of course, there's been a lot of talk about PGS and um, should it be done routinely? Should it not be done routinely? But I'm sure you're going to lay all this to her. So over to you, Carmen. You have the floor. You have to unmute yourself. Carmen, you have to unmute yourself. Now, I think that now you can you can hear me, right? Yes, yes. And can you see my screen? Yes, sure. Okay, so uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank you for the invitation and to be here and share all the work that we have done these few years, these last years um, in regarding the PGS and the non-invasive PGS. So the question uh, that, when, when, that when we start is if PG, PGS is the answer to embryo selection. 
See? Okay. As disclosure, I am full employee and Igenomics and Igenomics Foundation. Okay, so as, as you know, um, the incidence of aneuploidy according to maternal age increases. So this is a problem uh, nowadays when, at least in, in most of the countries, the maternity uh, age is growing and growing. So um, we perform this, this is internal data of uh, igenomics, the year, I think it's two, yeah, the 2015. And as you can see on the, on the right, we have uh, cycles uh, without PGS performed and with PGS performed. And this is the ongoing pregnancy rate that we got per embryo transfer. As you can see, uh, the blue, a uh, column is always uh, higher than the gray. That is because we are performing this, this uh, screening to the embryos. And uh, the difference is obviously uh, higher uh, as the mother is older. So um, the PGTA, that is the, the PGS, the indications of these techniques are to improve pregnancy and implantation rates, decrease miscarriage rates, decrease multiple pregnancy if uh, we can perform a single embryo transfer, and decrease the time to pregnancy and the emotional burden that the couples suffer, and also to improve the cost, the cost efficiency of the treatment. The indications are, are, are a lot. Uh, the more important are the advanced maternal age, a uh, prior pregnancy or child with chromosomal abnormalities, uh, implantation failure, recurrent miscarriage, several male factor, and in good, in good prognosis patients, uh, PGTA allow, allows us to perform single embryo transfer instead of double embryo transfer. So uh, we assure that we are not going to have a, a twins. In our RCT that we performed in 2017, we, we, we saw that if we perform PGTA in advanced maternal age uh, women, we, uh, the time to pregnancy is less. You go from more or less 14, 15 weeks to eight. And the number of transfer per patient obviously is lower because uh, we are um, not transferring in the PGTA uh, group the embryos that are aneuploid. And also uh, the time to, deliv to delivery uh, of a healthy baby, it's um, lower if we perform a, an analysis of the genetic uh, content of the embryo. But as you know, uh, PGTA is um, it's invasive. We are performing a, a blastocyst biopsy normally. Some, some clinics work with day three. And then we, in this case, we, we have like five or eight some uh, cells of the embryo. And then we analyze them with the next generation sequencing. And this is the results that we, that we get. In this case, uh, a monosomy in the chromosome 16. But uh, we were um, we wanted to go to a, an um, to be able to analyze the um, the DNA from the embryo, but in a non-invasive way. So we start uh, trying to analyze the the cell-free DNA that is released by the by the embryos to the media. So we culture from uh, the embryos from day four to day six in 10 microliters drops, uh, individual, obviously. And then uh, the clinic sent us the, um, the media once they remove the blastocyst. So the blastocyst remains untouched in the clinic. And in this case, you can see the, the profiles from the trophectoderm biopsy and the media from the same uh, blastocyst. And you can see that, that the results 
the genetic results are the same. So um, then we started with a new era of the non-invasive analysis of pre-implantation embryos. The first uh, question, uh, it was, okay, we know because there has been, there um, has been uh, like, we know that for several years that uh, the embryo releases DNA to the media but we were not sure if this, me this DNA was enough and if it was representative of all the chromosomes of the embryo. Because in the beginning, we were thinking, okay, uh, the embryo releases DNA, but does the embryo release DNA from all the chromosomes? So in the end, we can have all the information from all the chromosomes. And we saw that, yes, that it is like that. And that the embryo uh, releases DNA throughout all the, the development, but uh, more DNA is released uh, in the latest stages, when, when it, from morula to blastocyst stage. This is a, a summary of some of the papers that have been published in, in years. Uh, uh, performing um, this um, concordance rate uh, between the trophectoderm biopsy and the media from the same embryos. The first uh, paper was uh, published by Isha Monkey et al. And this was a proof of concept because the, the, um, the concordance rates that they obtained were very, very lower, only 3.5. But what they so uh, shown is that there was DNA from the embryo, so that we can we were, we can work with that. And then, as time passes, as you can see, a lot of papers have been published, but uh, all the um, the concordance rates vary vary a lot. Even these ones that are the last ones that are um, ninety seven point five and seventy five. So uh, in these cases, what is very important uh, to notice is that these, uh, all these uh, works were not completely non-invasive. Non Since some cases, assisted hatchet was performed in embryos on day three. Um, some um, embryos were vitrified and then the vitrified uh, were um, put in the, in the media. And in these two uh, last cases, they uh, collapse the embryo on day six and they uh, mix the blastocyst uh, media with the blastocell uh, media. So this, all this uh, works, the technology that is what we call like a minimal invasive uh, technology, but it's invasive. So what we were, we wanted to have a test that was completely non-invasive. So the embryo remain, remained completely untouched. And this is the, the story of our experience uh, with non-invasive. The first, the first uh, paper uh, that we published was in 2018. And this, is, was, this was our proof of concept. In this paper, we um, corroborated the presence of cell-free DNA that was coming from the embryos. We also studied the concordance uh, between the trophectoderm biopsy and the media from the same embryos. And we also uh, analyzed the impact of the maternal contamination. Then uh, in, in this, I'm mean, going to show you the results. The results were not um, very good. But with this result, we learn a lot of things to move uh, and, and improve uh, our protocols. So in 2018, last year, we published this uh, pilot study uh, with uh, 150 blastocytes. And with it, this pilot study, we improved the, our protocols, both the protocols of the IVF clinics and our genetic protocols in the lab also 
uh, we set which the, the perfect or the better timing for collection to, to get to obtain the most accurate results and also the clinical impact that this technique could have if we analyze the embryos with this technique. And our last uh, publication that has been this two months ago in American Journal of Obstetric and Gynecology, uh, we have uh, published the interim analysis of a multicenter pro pro prospective study that we are a carrion. And here we have more uh, a concordance among different centers because in this case, we have a lot of centers that we are working with. Also, we have a study the impact of different culture conditions and the concordance with the inner cell mass. So the first, our for, first proof of concept. Here we learn these things. First, that um, the, the, the spent culture media that was in contact with embryos had more sim significant more DNA than the control ones, that it was only media, that it was that had that wasn't been in contact with any embryo. In both amplified samples and non-amplified samples. Also, uh, in this uh, in around these uh, years, the most popular hypo hypothesis was that the the embryo the DNA that was released from the embryos coming from the uh, apoptotic cells of these, that the embryos have these um, um, mechanisms to, uh, to, to, to just remove the cells that are um, aneuploid, so the, the embryo can just uh, continue its development. But what we saw is that there was not, there is, uh, no uh, uh, significant differences amount, uh, between the amount of DNA that the euploid or an euploid uh, embryos released, releases to, released to the media. So the apoptotic origin was not um, a thing anymore for us. And then we also perform a, a study to see if there was any difference about uh, between the female embryos or the male embryos, and we didn't see any any differences in the amount of DNA that was released to the media. So this is uh, the um, the chart that we used. We we had uh, the embryos from day three to day five uh, cultured in embryoscope in twenty microliters of media. So um, in the end, we had from the same embryo, the trophectoderm biopsy and the spent culture media on the other side. We performed the whole genome amplification and the sequencing, and this is the results that we got. Uh, first, uh, the non-informative rate, rates were a little bit high, was near 9%. But the, the, the worst uh, result was the concordance. We saw that only 30.4% of the, of the trophectoderm biopsies and the media were concordant. But we saw that these this, this, uh, low concordance rates were due to the um, pa, uh, maternal contamination. This maternal contamination uh, could be partial or full. So we were uh, in some cases, in half of the cases, we were analyzing only DNA coming from the mother. So that was uh, uh, an issue. So in the in the next in the next um, project, uh, we focus on first improve IVF conditions and NGS protocols. Also, to estimate the opti the optimal time for media collection and uh, to assess the impact in clinical outcomes. So this is the, the, the workflow that we performed, that, that we used. We work with Genera, it's a clinic in, in Italy, and we had 115 blastocysts that were cultured in a standard 
uh, culture conditions of the clinic from day one to day four. On day four, uh, the embryos were washed in serial uh, drops. And on day four, on this day, the each embryo was placed in one in a 10 microliter drop in an individual, obviously. And on day five or on day six, depending on the development of the, of the embryo, the, the embryos were uh, cryopreserved and the cell-free, well, the media was sent to our, our laboratory. So the first, um, the first thing, the first wall that we hit was uh, that, as you can imagine, the, DN the quantity of DNA that the embryo releases is not a lot. And the protocols that we, that we were using, um, the whole genome amplification protocols are meant uh, to one to several cells. So uh, the first thing that we saw, it was like we it, here in the series, the conventional whole genome amplification that, that we were using for our uh, uh, tofectoderm biopsies and day three. Um, cases, and as you can see, the amount of DNA, and this is the timing culture of the embryo in the media, it was not enough until the embryo was nearly 72 hours in culture, which as you, as you can imagine, this is not, uh, we can't apply this to a clinic setting. We can have the embryo 72 days, uh, hours there. But uh, we modify some things in, in, our, in this protocol and in them you have the modified results. And with this modified protocol, we, can, we have enough DNA uh, to sequence from, in the media from, the, from 30 hours. And this DNA remains more or less stable all the time. So we were able to analyze now embryos with 30 hours in culture. So um, what we performed was we had uh, these 108 blastocysts and on one hand we had a uh, day five blastocyst. Uh, in this case, the informativity was 81.8%, which was not bad compared with our um, informativity in the, in the previous paper but the concordance was only 63, which is very low, which it was better than our 30%, uh, but it's, it was very low uh, for a clinical uh, application. Nevertheless, when we study the day six embryos, we saw that informativity was 100% in the case, and the concordance uh, rise, rise up to 84%. So this was very interesting. So we focus on these day six uh, embryos and the concordant results, as I mentioned, uh, was 84%. And also we have a 5% of results that were concordant. I, uh, with this, I mean that both uh, trophectoderm biopsy and the result of the media was euploid or an euploid but we have different genders. So in the end, we only, uh, we get, we take, we took this 84% of concordance results. The false negatives were only 2.5% and the false positives, 8.5%. Uh, so here we, uh, we, we learned that it was better to leave the embryos until day six in culture than uh, until day five. And this is the clinical outcome after single embryo transfer that we, that we show, well, that we uh, saw the, uh, in this study. Uh, I have to to, to tell you that then, as you can see, the number of samples is very low. So this was only uh, for us to know the trend, if it was a trend. So we have to, in this case, we had two groups of, 
of um, transfer. The transfer were performed according to the trophectoderm biopsy. So in both groups, the trophectoderm was euploid, but uh, in one group, the media was euploid, and in the other group, the media was an euploid. So what, what we uh, what we saw that is that it was very interesting and it was that the ongoing pregnancy rate um, the, that the clinical miscarriage sorry it was higher uh, in the in the cases where the trophectoderm was euploid but the media was not was an euploid so this was uh, a thing that um, shocked us so we. And then just follow the study. So this is uh, the last paper that we have published. In this case, we have worked with uh, a lot with more centers. I think it's eight, if I'm not wrong. And we have uh, studied the concordance between the media, the embryo cell-free DNA, and the trophectoderm biopsies from 1,301 human blastocyst. This is the, um, the workflow that we have followed. We uh, had uh, the recruitment, uh, very uh, easy selection criteria. Um, then the PGTA cycle was performed as regular by the clinic. So it was a biopsy. And then they sent us also the spent culture media. And then the, we analyzed by next generation sequence, sequencing both uh, types of, of samples. And then uh, uh, the, it was performed, the single, single embryo transfer was performed according to the trophectoderm biopsy results. Then we, an, we analyzed blinded the media, and then we just uh, match the media with the trophectoderm biopsy and study the concordance or disconcordance that we got. Also, we, we analyzed the clinical follow-up of the ongoing pregnancy. And in the, in the cases of miscarriage, we try to, um, to analyze also the, the products of conception just to check if the, if the fetus was abnormal or not. We work with uh, clinics just around the world. So in this case, uh, we had a, a more uh, different conditions since all, since all the, the, the clinics were working with their media, with their uh, different incubators. So we had a lot of different factors that we wanted to study if these factors could affect uh, to the accurate of the results or not. So we, with this 1,301 1, uh, uh, media, we had two objectives. The, one, the, the first one and the most important uh, was the evaluation of the concordance and the reproducibility of the test between the spent culture media and the trophectoderm biopsy. And also we had an, a subset of 81 a neoploid blastocysts donated for research. And in this case, we had uh, three, the three um, results. We had the T biopsy from these embryos. We had the inner cell mass uh, biopsy. And also we had the result of the media. If we focus on the media versus trophectoderm biopsy, the average of concordance was 78.2% uh, uh, being um, from 72 up to 86%. As you can see here uh, the, from the eight centers, the, the most important thing that the, the message to take home is that uh, even though our average was 78, we had 50% of the centers with more than 80% of concordance. So this uh, showed us that uh, the way that the clinic works affects the results. 
even though these results were not significant, different among all the clinics, but that you that we can achieve a higher concordance if we work uh, in, in in a proper way. As we had a lot of uh, different uh, variables in this study, we just wanted to see if some of these variables could affect the, the results of the, the, accurate, the accurate of the results. And we saw that if we, if, if we, if we were focus on the female age, the concordance rate between trophectomy and biopsy and uh, media was higher. Nevertheless, we didn't find uh, any dif significant differences uh, in the concordance rates if we talk about the, the brand of the medium that the, the clicks were using. And we didn't uh, find either uh, significant differences according to the incubator uh, that the clinic were using. And this is already the results of the concordance rates with the inner cell mass of these 81 blastocysts. And as you can see, um, the SVM, the media with the trophectoderm had a, a, a very high uh, concordance that it was the same that the, if we uh, compare the trophectoderm with the inner cell mass, and in the case of the media with the inner cell mass was uh, very, very high also. It was also inter interesting that if we, because we have seen that the concordance rate also um, is, dif uh, is different um, depending on the aneuploidies that the embryo has. If, an, if um, an embryo has a low mosaic aneuploidy or a segmental chromosomal aneuploidy, the, um, the concordance rate, rates are a little bit uh, different. And in, so in this case, what we, what we did is only um, take the, the results of the whole chromosome aneuploidies. Uh, we have seen that these, these kind of aneuploidies are the ones that had the higher concordance rate. So in this case, we, we see a 92% of concordance between trophectoderm and media, uh, nearly 86% media inner cell mass, and uh, 93% uh, among the trophectoderm and the inner cell mass. So in this case, what we, what we, obs what we observe and and it was that the, the, it seems that the DNA that the embryo is releasing uh, comes from both the trophectoderm and from the inner cell mass. Because some groups were thinking that maybe it was only coming from the trophectoderm. This is the, the, the part that is in contact with the, with the media. But we saw that, no, that inner cell mass is also um, releasing DNA, so the results are more accurate in this case. With all this uh, data, we have uh, launched the EMBRACE test, that is the embryo analysis of the culture environment, and it's a non-invasive test that allows the prior prioritization of the embryos to transfer. Um, uh, to transfer the embryos that have higher chance of being euploid, avoiding invasive uh, techniques like the embryo biopsy. So as uh, with this test, we prioritize the embryos with the, the higher, once embryos have the higher uh, probability of being euploid, so this, these embryos will be the first that we will, we will uh, say transfer this one and the, the interesting uh, is that this embrace test can be performed in all the patients. In some countries uh, the non like in Spain for example uh, we can't perform a, a PGTA if there is not indication 
for the PGDA. So with the non with this uh, non invasive approach, we can perform the the test to all the patients because we are not touching the embryo. We are only analyzing uh, the media that in other cases is just throw away. So um, our our main goals in this in this world were three. First, to define uh, the third goals for for ploidy, because we wanted um, we didn't want to to analyze um, by eye the the profiles of the of the of the embryos. We wanted to have an algorithm that tells that just tells us if the embryo is normal or not. So we define the threshold with all the information of these uh, concordance rates of these 1,000 embryos. Then we estimated the euploidy score. That euploidy score in the end is the, the probability of, this em of an embryo to be euploid. And then with this euploidy score, we establish a, a embryo prioritization. So this would be uh, the, the, re the report that uh, we will give with the embrace test. We will have, uh, in this case, this woman uh, has four embryos. And as you can see, we have two that are normal, that are employed. And then we have one abnormal that is a trisomy 17 and a, 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 a duplication in the chromosome 4. So uh, the, the operating score that is here, and then we have the embryo priority. So in this case, uh, this and this will be the first uh, embryos to, to, uh, to, to transfer, and then we will have the other ones. Um, and the, um, the euploid media, when we have an, a media as euploid, we know that more than nearly 85%, 80% of the cases uh, are in uh, concordance with, the, with an euploid trophectoderm biopsy. But in the, as I mentioned, this, this concordance varies uh, depending on the, on the aneuploid that we are facing. So, in the case of trisomies or monosomies, for, it, for instance, the concordance rate is very high. So if we, have a, if we see a trisomy in the media, it's, uh, in 80% of the cases, we are going to have an aneuploid media, an aneuploid uh, trophectoderm. But in the case, for example, of duplication, we have seen that mostly the duplication um, the segmental duplications, the, the media can have the, um, the duplication, but then it's not correlated to a uh, uh, segmental duplication in the, in the, in the trophectoderm biopsy. So in this case, the segmental, the, the embryos that have segmental duplications would be uh, first before than the ones that have a trisomy, for example. Obviously, for the chromosome 13, 21, 18, and sexual chromosomes, uh, this won't have a priority. Well, we will give the priority, but we also obviously will, won't recommend to, to transfer a trisomy, the, the trisomies that are, that are compatible with a life, uh, with, a, with a baby. And also, when um, the, the reports, uh, the, the prioritization of the embryos will be personalized for that woman, that woman, and in that cycle. So, uh, and in the um, when we have to um, co to give counsel to the patients regarding if transfer the embryos or not. We also will have to, to bear in mind the age of the, of the mother. Since we know that the percentage of euploidy decreases drastically as the, as the uh, age of the mother 
uh, grows. So we have we have to bear in mind that it's not the same to to transfer a segmental duplication in a thirty uh, five years old woman than in a forty four. But this will be a thing that uh, when we work with the clinics, we will give advice referring to the to this this um, how to handle the COPD score and the transfer. But the main the main um, uh, point here is that we are not um, saying transfer or not. So we are mm, all the embryos are having an opportunity to be transferred. So this is the, the main idea. It's not like in the PGTA that is transfer or not. Here is like more up the, the patient and the physician that have to, uh, to make a decision. And the open questions that hopefully I, I will be able to, to talk about them with you in not a lot of time is uh, first the basic research. We want to know uh, the origin of this DNA. We want to know, uh, we think that it comes from the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm biopsy and the trophectoderm cells, but we also want to see if the trophectoderm is uh, releasing more DNA than the inner cell mass, for example, that could be uh, a, pos a possible thing. Also the mechanisms how the embryo releases DNA, because we know that it's not an apoptotic cell that is just released to the media. Uh, and also, here we have different hypotheses. I'm not going to enter here, but this is something that we have uh, also um, in a study now. And then we are performing a randomized clinical study to see if the the, um, the implantation of the the embrace uh, improves the IVF uh, um, rates. So in this case, we have 15 centers or also around the world, and then we we have a selection criteria, and then we divide it. We will divide the the we, we are because we are working on that already we divide the, the patients into groups this is uh, in this in this uh, project all, uh, only the the patients that are, are in are patients that do not have an indication for pgta or they just don't want to perform a pgta and they have from, from 20 to 40 years old so we will have a control group that the single embryo transfer will, per, will be performed on day six, seven, depends on the development of the blastocyst and will be performed depending on the morphology, just as regular. And the, in the intervention group, we will analyze the spent culture media and then we will send to the clinic a report and they will uh, perform the transfer according to our prioritization report. So in this, with this study, we will be able to see if the, the application of the embrace improves or not the uh, life birth rates and the, uh, the clinical rates in general. These are all the centers that are involved. Now we have centers in Japan and in, in Australia, so we have more, more diversity and this is always good. And as a conclusion, um, uh, we have the we have several cell-free DNA in the media of the embryos, and this cell-free DNA can be amplified, can be analyzed, but NGS, and it's representative of the chromosomal content of the embryo, of all the chromosomes, which is very shocking uh, to us. Was very shocking in the beginning because it was like, okay, the embryo releases DNA, yes, it's it sounds good, but that in all the cases we can see the uh, the representation of all the chromosomes. It was very very interesting to us. So the concordance rate uh, rates that we have now are are 
uh, between 84 and 85 at day six. We have a high concordance rates of this cell-free DNA uh, with the inner cell mass, which is very interesting too. Uh, and the embryo cell-free DNA analysis will, al will, will allow, la allow us to, pri to prioritize embryos for transfer according to the aneuploidy risk or eploidy uh, percentage, both are the same. And with this new strategy, we will be able to avoid embryo biopsy and the, and the conflict that uh, some clinics, countries, or patients uh, could have in, the, in discarding potential euploid embryos uh, in PGTA. So to finish, just to acknowledge uh, our, all the people that is working uh, behind these results that are, you know, I'm sure that you know Carlos Simon, that is our head of scientific advisor. And then the, the clinical study team that they help us with all the uh, paperwork with the clinics, our, our bioinformatics and IT team that have, has helped us with the algorithm development. And also uh, my team, that is the, the research non-invasive PGT a team that is uh, led by Carmen Rubio, I'm sure that you know her. And then as a biologist is Luis and myself and they are our technician that is uh, Lucia. That is the one that has been uh, analyzing all the samples in the lab. So now if you have any doubt, I'm all yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Carmen. Um, getting us through uh, the cell-free DNA, that's, uh, which might be applicable to all embryos in the future. Yes, and uh, very nice talk, and I'm sure we'll learn one or two things from there. I'm going to go straight on to Alexia to talk to us about time-lapse technology, yeah. the embryo selection. Alexia, the floor is yours. Do you see my slides? No. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, hello from me. I'm Alexia Hetzbarasidou, and I'm consultant in clinical and consultant clinical embryologist and director of Embryo Lab Academy. I have no conflict of interest. And during my lecture, I'm going to present to you the all challenges of conventional embryo morphology assessment. I'm going to talk about the new challenges that came along with the time-lapse technology. And I'm going to summarize where we are at the moment after 10 years of experience on morphokinetic assessment, thanks to time-lapse technology. And I will, end up, I will end my talk with future perspectives on embryos assessment and embryo selection. So without doubt, the single most important question in assisted reproduction is what embryo we should transfer. What embryo is the most viable to achieve the best pregnancy rate? What embryo about, uh, uh, among our in vitro produced embryo is, is viable to, for, to tra for transfer or for cryopreservation among similarly looking embryos. And we do know that among our embryos, we have a viable degree of viability. And some of the embryos, they may look good, but they are not viable. Since the beginning, the very beginning of, uh, of IVF in 1978, we knew that our biggest challenge is to select the embryo because it determines the efficiency of our outcome in IVF treatment cycles. From the very beginning, we had one tool to assess embryos, our inverted microscopes. And we had this, a sole criterion to select our embryos, their morphology. And this is the reason why we constructed the, the, uh, the embryo morphology assessment, the conventional embryo morphology assessment that Joy so nicely presented a while ago which involves, we try to make 
the best out of what we had. So we, this way of assessment is based on the snapshot assessment on the time base in specific time points, points during the embryo development. And for this purpose, we need to remove the embryos from the incubator in order to assess them. And the assessment involves all the criteria Zoe talked about, the number of the cells, the size of the embryo in an effort to identify which embryo follows the most favorable path of development that it's an indication of high viability. While we try to separate them from the other embryos that seems to follow a less favorable route, uh, uh, embryo development pathways, such as the embryos with high fragmentation or more than two pronuclei or the late cleavers. But again, we knew since the very beginning that this approach, this conventional morphological assessment had its limitations. These are our old challenges that are still with us because we do know that this assessment, with, we, have, have, we have just three or, or up to six, depending on the protocol we are using, assessments of the embryos and on this limited data we have to base we have to decide on the fate of the embryo at a risk of underestimating an embryo or overestimating its potential for implantation and as joy said in her lecture there is an insignificant uh, interoperator variability and overall we know that this tool has a very low predicted value that's why we keep on searching for a more uh, efficient tool. And this is the reason why the practitioners in the IVF world, they keep on transferring more than one embryo, taking obviously the risk of a multiplied pregnancy in an effort to sustain high pregnancy rates. But it's not only this, one very significant limitation of this time, uh, this conventional morphology assessment is, it, is that it is time-based. So during the rush hours of morning, when we do have all the pickups and the embryo transfer, we do have to check our embryos. That means that we have an increased mobility around the incubators, an additional increased mobility around the incubators in an effort because we need to check our embryos. So embryos are removed from the incubators in order to be assessed under the inverted microscope. And we do know that this arises an issue of safety and an issue of disturbing the cultural environment of the embryo. Because we do know that whenever the embryos are removed from the cultural environment, there are significant variations on critical cultural parameters, such as pH and temperature. And we do know from previous work that these kind of fluctuations may have an adverse effect on the viability of our embryos. It was back in 1997 when it was first uh, reported the use of time-lapse system for assessment of the early fertilization events for human embryos by Payen. It took, as a, an idea, was innovative. So it took 10 and more years for a time-lapse system to be uh, introduced officially into clinical uh, practice uh, by two pioneers in the field of time lapse. And for the first time, thanks to this innovative technology and technological achievement, we were able to, to follow up and monitor our embryos in an almost constant way and assess the morpho the, the, how the morphology is turned is uh, how the embryo is transformed while it develops. And since the morphology for the first time was linked to the time factor, the term of morphokinetics was first introduced. And for us, the embryologists, we found ourselves in our wonderland because for the first time, a dream was realized. We were able to monitor our embryos in, the, in, in extreme detail 
without disturbing them, without having, without a negative impact on them. So this created an over, a, 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 brought us in a level of euphoria. We felt like we were this close into, into developing the golden standard of embryo assessment and embryo selection that we just needed some time alone with our embryos into the time lapse in order to allocate which of the key features of the embryo development and the morphokinetic patterns have a predictive role. So we could base a, 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 the formation, the development of an algorithm that would be suitable for accurate embryo selection, or maybe not only in terms of viability, but in terms of chromosomal constitution as well. We could maybe select the chromosomical healthy embryos as well. So it would be a, a, a way to develop a convincing strategy for single embryo transfer and obviously optimize our pregnancy rates after embryo transfer. So all this euphoric situation made us all more than willing to pay the price of this rather costly new technology. So not surprisingly, time-lapse systems became available in the market soon. A time-lapse incubator is normally a standalone incubator with integrated inverted microscope, one or more, coupled with digital cameras that captures images, digital Im images of the embryos while they are developing in specific predefined time intervals. And these images are processed into videos. So we are lucky enough to have all these videos recorded and follow up the progress of the embryos in a real time fashion. And suddenly we found ourselves in a totally different situation from which we were used to. Instead of three to five uh, to six recordings per embryo, we had an extensive amount of, of information. We had more than 1,000 images per embryo. And all these images were provided to us in a non-invasive way. So we had time to go through all this video, uh, uh, go back again, revisit details of their development. And it was, it's not time-based. We can do that in our convenience, so it's more flexible. And we can access it remotely. It's safer because we don't remove our embryos from the incubator, incubation, incubator. And obviously, it's a unique opportunity because it's a great chance for us for the first time to, to observe and really understand our embryos, how they, uh, uh, um, uh, what different patterns of development they exhibit. And for, for following up these new morphokinetic development, there have been a number of time parameters uh, um, introduced that describe the morphokinetic pattern. And now we had for each embryo, instead of three to six recordings, we had a number of time parameters or time events parameters. Time parameters stands for the time that an embryo needs to move from once from reach a stage of development, such as the T, uh, the time uh, that ex it excludes the first, the second polar body, the time it reaches the two cell states, the modular states, or the blastocy states, while time events describe the duration of time an embryo needs to move from one stage to the other stage, from two cell states to four cell states, or four cell states to eight cell states. So suddenly, we had to change our mindset when it comes uh, for embryo assessing and embryo selec selection. And there's been lots of time invested by, by lots of different groups and efforts in order to allocate which of these time parameters have a significant impact and could be used as a way to predict the embryo's ability to develop to day three or day five or implant. But up to now, despite the quite extensive 
list of different key parameters, we, we, it seems that there is not, there is a very little agreement among the groups. And at the moment, very few of these time parameters seems to um, enjoy to have a wider acceptance. I just listed a few here. I listed the time for PM finding. It seems that it plays a role. It has a significant impact on, on predicting embryo development. Time for first cleavage, we knew that, but now it's verified. The duration of, the, of, of an embryo um, spent during the two cell states, it seems to be very important for the developmental potential, the future developmental potential of the embryo. The time an embryo needs to go from five cell states to eight cell states, and a new marker after thawing of, of our blastocysts, do they re-expand? How long do they need to, to fully uh, uh, gain the, 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 the full, reach the full expansion states. And while in this level of trying to find what embryo is more viable, it seems that there is no agreement. There is, there, are, there is another set of features where it seems that enjoys high, higher levels of agreement among the scientists. I'm talking about the atypical human embryo cleavage features that are special features that were rarely seen with the conventional system uh, or, or even missed, such as the reverse cleavage or the cell exclusion or, or the direct cleavage. Thanks to these parameters, we can see that quite often Embryos follow these atypical patterns of, of uh, behavior, morphokinetic behavior. And since that the majority of the groups, they do agree that these are signs of, of a lower implantation potential. So we, maybe they do not agree that much on which are the criteria to select the embryos, but it seems that they are more agreeable on the, the criteria for deselecting the embryos. So the idea behind the, the morphokinetic pattern was the, that to develop a unique and universal and standardized way of, of assessing embryos and selecting embryos of higher efficiency uh, in order to optimize or improve uh, the, uh, our, our pregnancy rates, which seems at the moment that they are not that, that much satisfying since morphology has a low predictive value. But despite the efforts all these 10 years, things are still progressing. It seems that this ideal morphokinetic path is still under construction. And Attempts have been made by different groups to, to develop these algorithms for, for embryo ranking in an effort, again, to improve the efficiency when selecting embryos and improve uh, implantation rates. And why, in some cases, the reported efficiency was significantly improved and more than satisfied, especially when compared to the previous conventional morphology assessment uh, strategy approach, we came across with a big obstacle. These um, algorithms, the manual algorithms, seems that they are not reproducible from one laboratory setting to the other. And if we think of it, it should not come to a surprise because an embryo is a unique ecosystem. It, it, it consists of a, a variety and a, a, a huge number of different parameters from which may be the external parameter, the, the, the location of, of the lab in the globe, on the globe, uh, the altitude, the climate, or, or parameters that are related to the, clinic, to the clinical part, such as the uh, stimulation protocols, the patient population, or lab parameters, such as the media we're using, 
Is it a sequential media, a, a one-step media, the size of the lab? Everything matters. And all these parameter, parameters interrelate and they create a unique environment, a unique, and, and this environment create, has a unique impact on the morphokinetic pattern of embryo development. So that's why we cannot uh, expect that the, uh, the embryos behave the same from one laboratory setting to the other. For many, many years, we know that a determining factor for implantation uh, potential is the chromosomal constitution of an embryo. And as Carmen said, the embryos that are not normal, they are normally unable to implant. So with the opportunity given by the time lapse, the theory of using the time lapse to identify key features for aneuploidy was tested. Unfortunately, at the moment, despite that the data that confirm that unemployed embryos, they, too, they do tend to behave a little bit differently. The data are not at the moment convincing for replacing the, the PGTA, which remains, of course, the method of choice with the time-lapse selection as a, as a cheaper option and, and uh, a non-invasive option because the efficiency has not been yet confirmed. However, the combination of the two technologies, when PTDA meets and collaborates with time-lapse technology, things can be really, really quite impressive. Because, and I'm talking out of experience, and we, I do um, um, agree with what Roquefort has reported earlier, because when PTDA or PGD cases are uh, um, cultured into time lapse, then we can achieve a much an optimized timing for biopsy. So that means that our biopsy procedure is less traumatic. And once we have the genetic report, we go back to our fluid embryo morphokinetic patterns and we select the embryo with the better morphokinetic behavior. In this way, we, uh, we achieve higher pregnancy rates after the transfer of our Floyd embryos. So despite the initial, let's say, honeymoon period where everybody was excited, up to now, after 10 years of experience, it seems that data that do not confirm the clinical benefit of the use of time lapse. According to the recent Cochrane study, which included nine RCTs and over uh, almost 3,000 cases, in, it, was, it was shown that there was not a clinical benefit or the evidence is still low on, on, uh, for, for the use of time lapse, either as a culture system or a selection system. So maybe we just need time, or we, we need to develop further time-lapse um, uh, abilities, capabilities. Uh. ESRE recently published the time-lapse recommendation, which I highly advise you to see. And, uh, and, and, and um, study because I think that it summarizes in a very good way all the progress on time lapse concerning the embryo assessment and embryo selection. All the technical consideration, it talks about the technical consideration one needs to consider before implementing a time lapse technology in the lab. Daily matters on how, with what media to use, what type of time lapse to use, etc and how much of information should be shared with the, with the patients when the embryos, the embryos are cultured in a time-lapse incubator. It's a very useful guideline, uh, recommendation, no, not guideline. So time-lapse technology in 2020, where are we now? Despite the lack of convincing clinical evidence for the benefit of the use of time-lapse, it seems that its use is growing globally, maybe because people are attracted by the idea of uninterrupted 
culture environment, we think that this is the best thing, the best cultural conditions to provide to our patients, and we want to, to, to try to provide it. Or maybe we want to invest on what, what time-lapse system promises, time-lapse technology promises for the future. Manual algorithms, some of them seems to provide high uh, improved selection efficiency for embryo ranking, but in case somebody wants to uh, implement one of these in their setting, please foresee a validation period to make sure that it works in your setting as well. Despite the lack of evidence, time lapse is still a unique tool to understand embryos, our embryos. The more we interrogate them and the more we annotate them, the deeper and the more we learn about them. It's an excellent quality tool. Whenever we want to implement a new intervention in our setting, such as change of a media, a new freezing of oocyte protocol, a vitrification of oocyte protocol, we can use time lapse to see whether there are altered morphokinetic patterns in the embryos exposed to this, morpho to this new intervention. Globally, it seems that in most cases, laboratories, you have one or more time lapse system among the conventional incubators. So a, a, a protocol with uh, which patients should be included in the time lapse system should be in place. And since this exciting period is very dynamic and very um, and still evolving, whenever we have good data, it's excellent idea to share them, to publish them, uh, because they could contribute in the better in, in improving our understanding on our embryos. And it's always an idea, a nice idea to be part of this new era, an exciting era. As for the future, it seems that. For the first time, we know more than ever, and we have a very supporting technology, new technology. We have all these new terms such as machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence, that promises us that we are more ready than ever to, to develop and maybe soon adapt the automated algorithms that Dr. Giles will tell us soon about what to expect. But is embryo an embryo only the morphology? It's morphology. Uh, I think that we soon be able to combine this critical information, the morphology, with the genetic constitution in a non-invasive way, as Carmen said before. So that means that we had we will have soon, hopefully, more information about every embryo, its embryo. But this will not will never be completed un unless and hopefully soon we will have a, 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 a way the technology that will allow us to measure the, the the metabolic activity of an embryo either by assessing it directly like like the, i'm talking about the film method that dr sakas is, has recently described or indirectly by quantifying metabolic biomarkers in the spent media of the embryo in, a, in an, a way to see how the embryo modifies its cultural environment as a result of its metabolic activity. And once we reach this milestone achievement, we will be closer than ever to unravel the mystery of embryo physiology. And then we will reach a point where we will choose, assess, and select our, our embryos as a result of deep knowledge and deep understanding. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Alex. Um, thank you for taking us through the world of morphokinetics of the embryo. And um, well, I'm sure there'll be some questions. I already have some for you. Uh, so, but without, much ado, I'm going to invite uh, Gilles to uh, do his presentation, which is on artificial intelligence and embryo selection, the future. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and to, to be speaking to you all. You can hear me and you can see my screen, I believe. Thumbs oh, up, sorry, everyone. Sorry. 
Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you for those excellent um, talks as well. And they really lead on very nicely to my talk. Um, I've chosen for um, my initial picture here, um, this picture to show really how far we've gone. Uh, it was taken in 1956 and it shows a picture from IBM's data processing division. It's transporting a hard drive and then there were for, for hire. It held a whopping five megabytes of storage, um, something today which could fit into your pocket and has almost half a million times more memory. But before I begin, just some disclosures, disclaimers. Um, I'm an advisor for Dittel Engineering and AIT Technology, which make IVF labs, Lego style. Um, custodian, who make RFID tags, which can be read in liquid nitrogen. And more relevant to the talk today, um, AIVF, which is optimizing IVF treatment uh, with the power of AI. But with time lapse, um, how far have we progressed? And we saw a very nice summary there by Alexia. For me, it's a bit like um, Harry Potter and the Mirror of Eriset, if you're familiar with that, because you can spend a lot of time looking at a mirror or looking at a screen in a time lapse um, machine searching for that perfect embryo. Uh, Time-lapse literature has looked at different variables um, and some weight has been put on more variables than others. And each paper in several cases has looked at different treatment outcomes. So this has all been gaining interest, but it hasn't been transferable as we've seen uh, to another clinic perhaps. And while Jabba Pipensky, an early pioneer of time-lapse, showed in 2013 in a meta-analysis, time-lapse could improve clinical pregnancy rates, um, but this is still unclear to many people to see the advantages. In the same year, Chen um, showed conflicting reports. And while the popularity of time-lapse continues, um, in some countries, it hasn't been accepted um, that greatly. For example, from a survey from uh, Dolinko, we can see that in the USA, only 17% of the clinics actually have time lapse. Um, and there's no universal pattern to fit all, as we've seen before. Um, several studies have shown annotation when we can set those time limits, increase the accuracy through time lapse. For example, Sunval in 2013 validated the precision of time lapse, showing that there's a close association between observers, that's the embryologist, checking the time events um, closely to what we saw in the machine. And in a study by Martinez has shown agreement between clinics in most time points, irregardless of which time lapse device they use. And more recently, Arnaud Renier and Thomas Friou, working in NON, has demonstrated that with an automated system, um, this agrees strongly with a manual assessment. So that is of embryologists. And as you can see, the variance is small between what the computer predicts at that time event and what an embryologist scores indeed, showing good concordance between the annotations and the manuals. Now this was done in about 700 embryos or so, but the time is right perhaps for AI to help us do our decisions for embryos. Um, but what is artificial intelligence? Um, well, it's a theory that computers can perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence. The idea came first, in fact, it goes back over 80 years with the concepts of Alan Turing of Enigma fame. And then came machine learning and finally deep learning, which is what's driving the AI explosion today. Machine learning is the approach to achieve AI and in its most basic, it's using algorithms to pass data, learn from it, um, and make a prediction. Um, the machine learning, you train it with large numbers of data, and you use algorithms to perform a task, often using a decision tree. And we saw that in the previous lecture there with a simple decision tree going, um, looking at the embryos, if they're included or excluded in a certain system. Deep learning, is the techniques for implementing machine learning and has flourished, especially um, in the last 10 years by parallel processing um, with ever cheaper and faster computers. 
Um, deep learning uses neural networks inspired by the understanding of biology of our brains, uh, like a decision tree on steroids. And in time lapse, we know what we see. Um, and you can put a mouth under the microscope if you wish, and you know what you're looking at. There are many new techniques emerging in the IVF arena, and many webinars have shown that recently. Um, but this technique speaks the language of the embryologist, and the language is morphology. Like no other emerging technique, um, it is applicable for the advancement due to artificial intelligence, and finally making the microscope into a diagnostic tool. And for this, we need deep neural networks. And the image you've seen here, this matrix on the right, um, is seen in many papers that we see now. But I'd like to sort of explain a bit more because there's a lot about AI being spoken about, but I want to sort of take the, um, have a look under the hood, if you like, and have a look at what's happening. Um, we can simply think um, of the part of a network as being a neuron. Um, it's a function, and a function is a fancy word that describes something that takes an input applies the logic and outputs the result. A neuron can be described as one learning unit. Um, a neural network is a whole bunch of neurons interconnected. Um, and this usually involves many tiers. So the first tier is where you have the input level. The last tier is the output level. And in between is a whole network of functions, a whole load of maths going on. So in the case of if we had to distinguish with machine learning between a dog and a cat, the neural network consists of digital inputs which process multiple, multiple layers of connecting neurons, <clears throat> excuse me, progressively detecting features and providing outputs. Now it's simple to us to detect a cat from a dog, even a child can do it, but the problem has only recently been addressed by the computer and would you believe by a competition which was posted um, online to that effect. Now you'll hear a lot with time lapse about um, different types of machine learning. And really there's, there's two sets. Um, one is supervised learning. Um, in this example, you would label input data, such as a dog, and hope that you classify the computer that way. And when you presented it with a dog, it would then predict correctly that you'd chosen that. In supervised, you give um, a training set of data and you would say, train on this, predict this, and get this prediction. Um, and work out a bunch of equations. The input data at this stage, as you probably heard, is called ground truths. But the other set of, of AI is really the holy grail, and that's um, unsupervised learning, where this evaluation of the data, for example, the dog and the cat, can be clustered into similar types. But you could easily do this another way and look at the embryo types, the, the sample we've chosen here. Now, clustering helps the classification process. Uh, analogy of unsupervised learning would be learning a computer to play chess. Now, where well, you don't know the outcome of the chess game, you just say play. You tell it the rules of chess and don't give it any grandmaster examples or no examples of the games. You just say, learn what happens. In unsupervised learning, the machine does a lot of exploring while the unsupervised learning is good because you can actually track to see what's important. So in all the studies using supervised learning, we can perhaps see the indications in the embryos, what's happening. But with unsupervised, we don't know how it got that decision. And you've often heard of it called as the black box. So the whole process could be summarized thus. The embryo image is subject to segmentation, sort of sorts out the pixels into large components. Um, feature extraction, which really is pattern recognition, and it builds derived values. Um, something which is quite new is going through dimensionality reduction, which is very big in mass at the moment, but basically is a way of reducing all the input variability. It cleans up the data. The less information which is fed into the computer disorganized, the faster the algorithm will learn. And finally, we'll use that classification using those neural networks, which we told you about. Well, how does a machine see? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank a former PhD student of mine, Timothy Osler, for the kind permission to use these images um, working with Cardiff University and the KES2 grant. He provided these from his early investigations. The first example of how a computer could see an embryo is 
um, a threshold and clustering. The pixels here are information and it decides if they're important. The red lines show something is important going from dark to light, but it's a rather crude way of showing this. And you can probably see um, there's a lot of noise in that picture and it's quite hard to predict. But this is one of the most basic ways that people have used machine learning to look at things. Another way is snakes, um, which is a bit more refined. It finds structures by expanding out from given points of the circle and it finds out cell mass. And just one final way is the level set method where it takes a pixel from an arbitrary place, let's say at the top left, for example, and spreads across the image. Then it finds an edge, it will class that as zero. So what you really get is a contour map of the embryo and this gives much more detail. And here you can see the detail um, both on the left and the right, perhaps of the cell membrane, the perivitaline space and the zona and the well. So all these tools um, are being used in this type of research, but I'd like to highlight a few papers. First one from 2013, which really the first time that AI was uh, looking at um, this department of science, if you like, you looked at embryo and egg classification using texture descriptors. This was um, a small study testing existing computer systems at that time. And it was suggested that it could be used as a more practical aims in normal IVF settings, such as deciding if a cycle should go for freeze all or fresh transfer. So even in 2013, um, they were quite on the ball. Um, one other study was Tran from David Gardner's group in 2018, who created a deep learning model named Ivy. And they all seem to be um, named after women nowadays, I can see, that were fully automated and predicted the probability of clinical pregnancy direct from raw time data. It used over 10,000 samples, it used eight clinics, um, and it was very good at predicting um, the outcomes. And it all took this from a technique which was tabula rasa, which was a concept of learning completely from scratch with no influence. It had a strong um, area under the curve, but we'll get to that later. And Craig um, in Denmark presented a fully automated blast assist in a cell mass and trivector term grading system, um, looking over 7,000 embryos and using between five to 46 uh, embryologists looking at that. And that system was at least on par with human embryologists on quality estimates, better than average with inner cell mass and trivectoderm scores, and slightly better at correlating embryo quality prediction and implantation than its human uh, counterparts. Um, and briefly a paper by Cornell, a very beautiful paper, which I would suggest you read, um, which was done in 2019, which used for the first time convolutional neural network, which is used nowadays to solve many problems with medical images, where they use 3D neural networks that deal with width, depth, and height connections. So that matrix got even more complicated. The computer would have um, only two criteria, whether it was good or a poor embryo. And using over 500,000 samples, uh, pictures of embryos, I should say, they could predict embryo quality and the area under the curve was 0.98. Um, and this outperformed individual embryologists. And looking at a circular heat map, it demonstrated the labeling habits of five embryologists in almost 240 embryos were closely related to the AI predictions. And when it was compared with the majority vote of the embryologists, um, it had a prediction of 96%. But what's all this area under the curve? Um, Everyone sees about this, that there's a lot of those, those papers there. Well, um, it's an ROC curve. It's a receiver operated characteristic curve. Um, and it's a way where you can test models performance against each other. Um, the orange line is where the true positives equal the true, the false positives. And therefore, if it's along that line, the, the model is no better than random or the model has no benefit. The Y axis is the sensitivity or the true positive rate and the x-axis is the false positive rate. Values for these graphs go from a confusion matrix, uh, which is the box you should see on, um, let me just see, on the left there, um, where you find out what is true when it's supposed to be true and the prediction if it's negative, if it truly is negative. So 
at one, one, we correctly classify all the positives as positive, but incorrectly classify all the negatives as well. Again, this is perhaps um, a better scenario where the threshold is better than the previous one, where all positives are identified, but half the false positives are still included in this message. And going along, we can fill out an area under a curve, and we can see that the largest end of the curve should be the one that we choose. But it must be um, emphasized that is an AI chasm, even with a high area under the curve, it could be 0.99, for example, it has to be relevant or not related to increasing clinical outcome. So you'll see a lot of these area under the curves in the papers, it's just important to evaluate them correctly. And some interesting advances have come from two groups, um, first by Alejandro Chavez from the New Hope Mexico, that prove that artificial intelligence lends itself even to image analysis from just static pictures. Using an algorithm, again, the female name Erica stands for Embryo Ranking Intelligence Classification Algorithm. It was trained to rank embryos based on ploidy and implantation potential and have the advantage, say the authors, of not even requiring time-lapse system. Erica had over 1,000 still images um, and compared it with embryologists. And in this case, it had a predictive value of 0.79 for predicting euploidy and could rank a euploid embryo first almost in 80% of the time and one euploid embryo in the top two blastocysts that it shows in 95% of the time. So if you look at the embryos on the right and you try and choose the best one in the image, some of you might have chose embryo two. Well, here we can look at the embryo grading by the embryologist, then the ranking assigned by Erica and the classifier together with the PGTA result. And we can see that Erica is quite predictive of what embryos transfer. And finally, an area perhaps overlooked in most AI systems is the first 24 hours, which was presented by Marcus Masenge recently um, with the collaborative work he's done with AIVF and Ivy Valencia. He presented this at this year's ESHRA. Ivy have experienced uh, for many years looking at the first 24 hours uh, since in 2014, there's been publications by Jesus Angela on this first cell cycle and its impact in IVF results. In fact, 20 years ago, there was a lot of work looking at the Z score and the polar body alignment. But now this work has gone much more advanced with artificial intelligence. Um, they look at features from the pronuclei using computer images and identify features that have never been seen before. The team in collaboration developed an artificial intelligence algorithm to extract and measure features. They used 2000 ICSI fertilized donor eggs. It was only looked at cycles with live birth rates and it's single embryo transfer using embryoscope. A deep neural network was developed based on these parameters and only using computer vision, it could see things never seen before, such as the wrinkling of the cell membranes and not just the appearing and disappearing of the pronuclei. So there's a lot of things that it could look at and it predicted the high quality blastocysts on day five with an area under the curve of 0.665, which is not too bad if you think about it just being the first 24 hours. So it's not just the first 24 hours that we have to agree on, um, but it follows up from a study which ARVF had done at last year's ASRM as well. Um, and they looked at the halo effect, which was happening, um, in the first event around the pronuclei. Um, they used a lot of things. Now we can see a live examples of how the machine can look at an embryo. We are using explainable artificial intelligence, domain expertise, data science, deep learning. All these complicated methods are coming together in using artificial intelligence to have a predictive model. You can see here, there's a heat map here. It gave a prediction at 40 hours and it will then again give a prediction at 120 hours for the final result. Now, all this needs a huge amount of data and anyone interested in contributing data to this study, they'd be most welcome because they're very data hungry. The search for data um, is the most important thing. Data is gold, as they say, and every year there's a fancy name that we can use for artificial intelligence. But the importance is how the algorithm 
performs with the test data. I'll just let this video run and I'll tell you more about the data. At the start of the um, talk, I talked about the IBM supercomputer. Well, IBM and other companies can now predict with new accuracy all significant life events of a human, like marriage, having a child, buying a house. All this by other interactions other than the normal demographics, which are age and gender. So artificial intelligence is looking at things which we'd never have thought about before. And that specifically applies also with IVF. So we need a lot of data. And this data is a tremendous challenge which we have. We need data training, which are examples which we set to a parameter that go into model building when it learns and creates a new model. Some data is put aside and used for test data, which is fed into the last evaluation and used to test the data. And then we need the raw data to, to see if it can shoot out a better prediction. The current limitations, apart from hype, are bias, and in, artificial intelligence amplifies bias. And it's very difficult to have that without when you're using humans. Some well-known cases of AI and bias have been facial recognition algorithms um, that do not represent different groups. And they've been shown to be racially and gender biased. A high profile case of using a skin le lesion algorithm for healthcare, which had questionable clinical safety because it wasn't taking into account ethnic minority samples. So the only way in AI to avoid bias as is life is to have a large, big experience and improve diversity, both in your human workforce working on AI and also in the diverse data itself. And finally, the big question is, will artificial intelligence take over the role of embryology? Well, if you look um, at the obvious industry, the car industry with uh, driverless cars, I think we are a long way from that at the moment. The Society of Automotive Engineers have categorized the level of artificial intelligence from zero to five, where zero is non-automation to five, which is full automation with no human backup at all. The car operates with all conditions. For example, level one that helps the car drive and stay in lane. Level two is automated cruise and lane control. But with, with us, with AI and with medicine, it is unlikely that artificial intelligence will get past level three, which is called conditional automation, where some things um, are done just always need a human being on site. Human health, and in particular IVF, is too precious um, to perhaps go to level four, where only very limited backup is needed. So in the future, the road looks well, and in the words of Dr. Emmett Brown, where we're going, we go the road. So there's further developments ahead in AI, which will be exciting for us all. So I thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Gillies. And that's been a wonderful talk. And um, it's so reassuring that you took us to the future and brought us back. And uh, most importantly, you made us to realize that you will not be jobless, even after all this is, uh, <laughs> is in use. OK, so Dami Atiba will be taking some of the questions and then so that we can wrap up on time. Thank you. OK, good evening, everybody. I would like to say thank you to all our presenters. It's been very enlightening. Um, this question, no doubt, the question of selecting the best embryo, no doubt, is very important to embryologists all over the world. Uh, so thank you to all our no notable, very, very, very notable presenters. So I have some questions. I'm going to start with Joy. Um, I have a question for Joy. Would you cancel embryo transfer if there is no good quality embryo available for transfer? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Um, I'll say no. If um, what you have, uh, like from the studies that I also uh, showed in my presentation, whereby we have less uh, attractive looking embryos morphologically, also gave a uh, 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 live bet, led to live bet, at about 40% like that rate. So if what you have are, are, are not the best, if you have morphologically they are fair or uh, poor, if that's what you have, you shouldn't cancel embryo transfer. You could transfer what you have as they are also very capable of succeeding. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, true, so true, because um, as embryologists, for over the years, we've been surprised with some very bad quality embryos becoming very beautiful babies. So I have a question for Carmen. Um, this question says there is a belief that DNA released from the cell is some excretory product and that it will be abnormal. What's your opinion, Carmel? Yeah, uh, in this case, um, most of the, of the media that we have analyzed would be aneuploid, and we don't see that trend. We have more or less uh, the same proportion of abnormal and normal embryos that we, that we see with the regular, regular PGTA. So essentially, there's, there's no difference. No, we think that uh, the embryo releases DNA, and this, and this DNA could, could uh, come from normal cells or abnormal cells. So we don't know the mechanism yet, but it's not a, a, an apoptotic uh, mechanism, at least not in, in the, the majority. Maybe there are some apoptotic mechanisms working there, but the DNA that we sequence uh, does not have the, um, the, the, the characteristics of an apoptotic DNA and what I, what I mentioned. Uh, or in this case, most of the media would be unemployed and that, not, that doesn't happen. Thank you very much. Um, another one for Dr. Carmen. Do you think looking at transcriptomes or proteomes uh, separately or in combination with cell-free DNA would increase the concordance? Yeah, I mean, um, in our group, uh, we have, they started working with transcriptomic and proteomic because it was uh, easier at that point. And they didn't have, they didn't get uh, results that were um, that were good. It's, it's very very difficult to to um, to separate euploid embryos from euploid embryos uh, with the transcriptomic and the proteomic. And I think that this is most because, as I mentioned, the 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 um, quantity of DNA that is released is very, very low. And we are performing a whole genome amplification. And as you know, whole genome amplification uh, inserts some bias on the, on, the, on the results. And the, all the, paper, the, all the works that have been performed relating to the, the, the proteomic and the metabolomic of the embryo, like uh, glucose, um, uh, consumption or things like that, they haven't had uh, good results. So I think that maybe one day with a better techniques could be, but we don't, we don't think that it's possible now. It's possible now. Uh, thank you. Um, still, Dr. Carmen, do you do ICSI for all in order to do the cell-free DNA? Yeah, in the beginning, we were uh, only performing ICSI because we were uh, scared that as the main issue that we have is the maternal cell contamination, we were afraid that with an IVF, we will, we, we will have more maternal cell contamination. But we have seen, we have worked with a clinic in US and we have seen that there is no difference in the results. Uh, between ICSI or IVF. In fact, this clinic had uh, a slightly better concordance results in the IVF group, which was not significant, but the non-invasive PGTA uh, can be performed with both types of uh, fertilization. Great. Um, with the cell-free DNA analysis, what do you do with the mitochondrial DNA contaminants? Uh, the mitochondrial DNA that we find uh, there is, is like nothing. Is uh, we de we detect a little bit, and it's not um, uh, affecting the result. 
because it's like um, um, analyzed by the same in the same software, but in another in with with another pipeline. So there is not any, any issue with the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, we have we uh, in, the, in the beginning we were uh, also checking the mitochondrial DNA just to see whether uh, aneuploid embryos had more uh, mitochondrial DNA, but we didn't see any any difference between the normal uh, media and the uh, and the and normal. So we discarded the, the mitochondrial DNA. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Carmen. So going to Dr. Alexia, thank you so much for your talk. Um, this question says, do we have enough data to confirm the safety of the babies born from the embryos exposed to the continuous monitoring since it's only 10 years old? We never have enough data when it comes to IVF. So the more data we have, the more convinced we will be for the safety aspects of all interventions in IVF. So we should be really active in data collecting to make sure that what we do provide us uh, provide safe services to our patients so with the data back to your questions with the data we have in hand uh, it seems that the the, um, the use of time lapse uh, is a safe option for our couples if there's no effect on on, on the life birth or for the health of the babies but as you mentioned, and I mentioned, it's a new technology, 10 years only. So we should be very active on data collection. Thank you very much, Dr. Alexia. So um, Dr. Giles, I have a question for you. Is AI embryologist a possibility in the future? And does it have a better potential than all others at the moment, including the embryo school PGTA? And of course, human intelligence. So, are uh, embryologists going to be out of their jobs very soon? Well, essentially, that's the question. <laughs> well, certainly not. Certainly not. And, and as I alluded to before, um, um, it is a way which can help us with our decisions. And we'll never get to a stage where we'll just say, off you go, the embryos. Um, and even if that was the case, we still um, have a lot of science to do, okay, in the lab. Let's say it you know, becomes 50%. Automated. There's still um, a lot that the embryologists can do, but it purely is in a decision helping mode, which is of course what's happening with other types of medicine. There's there's AI in lots of types of medicine, whether it's image analysis for when people are having, you know, uh, chest X-rays, um, or any other other kind of diagnosis. You also have a lot of wearables where you can wear certain things, like your um, like your smartwatch can give you um, like. It can preempt certain health problems, which could mean an earlier time to the hospital. So we've still got a job, don't worry. That's that's very comforting to hear. <laughs> okay, so I have a question for Joy. Uh, one last question for Joy. The study on day three and day five embryo transfers, was it a retro retrospective study or randomized control trial study? Retrospective study. Okay, so retrospective study. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Back to you, sir. Okay, yeah, so I'm get, I guess uh, we've had uh, a swell time discussing about uh, optimizing IVF success in the ART laboratory. I must thank you, um, starting with Joy from Asaba, uh, to, to Carmen from Valentia. Uh, to Alex from Thessalonica, <laughs> and then to Jillis from Wills. Uh, and of course, Dami, who is next, next room to me. So <laughs> it's been a wonderful time. And uh, we've seen from the level of engagement from the audience that they also have thoroughly enjoyed themselves. So I'll just say thank you so much for taking time out to share your knowledge and experience with us and uh, definitely We'll see you some other time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're going to do that picture. You know what? Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
We have a picture now. Do, will we? Say, will you share it with us? Oh yeah, sure, 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 sure. Good. Okay, can we do that again so that we we can take it? Who's taking the picture? Someone. Someone's taking a picture. Yeah. Who's taking here? Okay. Yeah. Done. Good. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.